This episode on military aviation history is sponsored by Surfshark. Now, Surfshark is a secure VPN I started using during my trip to film more inside the cockpits for all of you. Having gone to Switzerland a few months ago, it really struck me how insecure it was to connect to the public Wi-Fi in my hostel. So when Surfshark approached me, I said, good timing, because before I do anything, I'll try out your product. I went to Munich with it, then to Berlin, then to the Netherlands. And I really liked how easy it was to use, how good the VPN handled the connection. Except for that one time when I was in the middle of nowhere in Germany. But if you know German internet, you know what I'm talking about. Don't think Surfshark actually had much to work with there. Um, and I simply enjoyed feeling less exposed without the fear that someone could access my data. Uh, also another point, uh, Surfshark allowed me to manually change my location, which then allowed me to watch a few clips on YouTube that were region locked. If you are, for example, coming over from the States to Europe and you want a secure, fast network and still be able to watch your favorite shows from all those streaming sites out there, consider getting Surfshark. I enjoyed it, we'll keep using it on my travels and if you use the link and the promo code in the description below, you'll get up to 83% off and an extra month for free. Hello everyone and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I'm your host Bismarck and today I want to talk about the reasons why the Luftwaffe never really conducted any sort of serious strategic bombing on the Eastern Front except for when it did. I believe this topic highlights quite a number of interesting issues from operational conditions over to doctrine to internal politics and of course the ever-changing parameters on the Ost front which are often ignored, uh, sometimes oversimplified or simply not taken into account. The sources for these videos are on the one hand, for example, this. The German air attacks against industry and railroads in Russia 1941 to 1945 by Ulf Höding, uh, written in 1970, published by Rand. But of course, that's not all, you know me. Uh, I've actually been recently been to the German military archives and also got some primary sources for this video. Um, this one is from 1943, for example. It's a Luftwaffe study, Der Kampf gegen die russische Rüstungsindustrie, the fight against the Russian war industry. And it's a telling sort of reflection on the success and mistakes of the Luftwaffe from 1941 to 1943 on the Eastern Front written by them themselves. Beyond that, of course, more sources in the description, as always. But before I go into this video, I want to make a quick disclaimer. I understand that perhaps in the comment section below, some of you have already, before you get to this part of the video, already written about the lack of the four-engine strategic bomber that would bite the Germans in the behind. Uh, the fact that the Oral bomber uh, wasn't built, being the fundamental game changer and so on. Three things here. First, such a monocausal argument doesn't hold up in my opinion, which leads me to point two. Uh, this video won't dwell into the strategic bomber question uh, for the Germans because I've got like a massive project running in the background that will dive right into that rabbit hole. So, uh, and so, so much more. And yeah, really stay pending, but it'll be done. Uh, third, as always, I want to base myself on the actual strategic and operational conditions on the Eastern Front uh, as far as I can ascertain them from the literature and the sources, both primary and secondary, uh, rather than go into the realm of speculation that really doesn't really further our understanding of what actually happened. The old, one might call it stereotype, that the Germans did not act upon the uh, strategic dimension of air warfare is overall supported by what happens on the Eastern Front. But as we will see, this is not because they didn't understand or appreciate that dimension or because they didn't have the capabilities. They actually did. In the early campaigns, you didn't need a four-engine bomber to hit Soviet industry where it hurt the most. More on that later, just remember that point for now. Uh, yet, once you start looking at the rationale behind the lack of strategic action, we start to appreciate the reasons, some of them quite rational for a time, uh, as to why the Germans never engaged on that dimension. This of course doesn't mean that this wasn't a fundamental mistake in the end, or a serious flaw in their thinking. That's a whole other discussion right there. But cracking open this case shows that it's not quite a simple case of X didn't do Y because Z. Um, before we actually look at the Luftwaffe, it serves to give a brief outline on its Soviet industrial capacity and its hotspots around 1941 uh, during the time of Operation Barbarossa. For this, I'll just do a quick breakdown between the production in front and beyond of the Urals. 
This is important as the popular narrative is always that the location and relocation of Soviet factories behind that famous mountain range was the reason Germany could never really hit industrial production. This is not necessarily the full story. In 1942, the majority of Soviet production was beyond that prominent geographical barrier, yes. Significant for sure, but that still left plenty of potential targets. After 42, the balance between the two regions actually shifted again in favor of that closer to the front lines. The Moscow region itself contributed significantly to the Soviet war effort, comprising about 22% of total production in pre Barbarossa 1940. This halved by 42, but it quickly recovered to pre war rates in the following two years. Moscow and the Moscow region is of particular importance, really. This region was within range of the Luftwaffe from 41 all the way to 44. Considering that after 42, a lot of production was again shifted to Moscow, this region remained a prime target. Open quote. Its share of total Soviet wartime industrial output cannot be determined exactly with the available data. Very roughly, however, it may be placed at around 25% of the total in 1942 and one third in 1944. Between those years, its output expanded by approximately 60%. End quote. So as a quick conclusion here, sure enough, the Luftwaffe couldn't hit everything the Soviets had, but they did have a beat on a significant portion of the Soviet industrial output, which was centered around Moscow, and could hit that if they wanted to. And it's not that the Luftwaffe considered such attacks to be superfluous. Uh, unlike the popular picture, the Germans actually did consider strategic strikes. Uh, nearly every directive uh, issued prior to a major campaign opened up the possibility of such attacks. That it didn't consistently act on this dimension prior to the invasion of the Soviet Union was due to the rapid victories Germany actually achieved in nearly every campaign. Uh, the point where strategic attacks were necessary in the Luftwaffe's mind was never really reached because victory preceded it. For Barbarossa, attacks on industry were considered, but such attacks were not pushed in the initially opening phase as the Luftwaffe was set to act on the tactical and operational level, aiming to disrupt Soviet supply lines, assist the ground elements and wrestle and neuter the Soviet Air Force. To quote, the ultimate objective of the operation is to establish a defense line against Asiatic Russia from a line approximately running from the Volga River to Arkhangel. Then, in case of necessity, the last industrial area left to Russia in the Urals can be eliminated by the Luftwaffe." End quote. Thus, when Germany flung itself against the Soviet Union, the Luftwaffe did what it always did. It launched an all-out effort against the Soviet Air Force, uh, disrupted Soviet supply lines, the front lines, provided support to the Wehrmacht, and only occasionally, uh, more haphazardly than premeditated really, hit factories in the Soviet rear without causing much of a damage. Um, the Germans in fact had forbidden the bombardment of fuel stores, food, and light metals, hoping to capture these themselves. Beyond interdiction and the occasional attack on rail yards, no attack really was conducted in the hinterland. Initially, the Luftwaffe of course achieved considerable success against the Soviet Union, whose air force in the aftermath of the invasion had become an empty shell, of course, until it recovered. Uh, this success did come at a price, however. Germany started Barbarossa with only six to 700 bombers less than it had during any of the previous operations, grand operations, I mean, and attrition slowly grinded the Luftwaffe into an ever smaller force. This wasn't a sudden blow, but a long-term slow disintegration. With the primary bombers, the Heinkel 111 and the Junkers 88, the Germans also faced two fundamental problems when it came to the bomber force. First was basing. Only few large enough airstrips to accommodate a Kampfgeschwader, uh, often set far behind the front lines, were actually available. Uh, second, the range to bomb load ratio on these bombers had been, well, it's been manageable in the West, absolutely, considering what they were used for, but now this presented an issue. The further you wanted to go, the more fuel you needed and the less bombs you could load. And this meant that at the furthest ranges, a German bomber usually sat at quite a small bomb load, and this was obviously not ideal. 
So to sum up, not only did they have too few bombers, but the Luftwaffe were, had also based these too far inland, thus prolonging sortie time and cutting bomb loads. This also gives you an idea as to why they chose to support the front lines rather than flying you know, substantial long-range missions. Um, and this also made more sense to the Germans. At least this way they had a quicker turnaround time on their aircraft and more ordnance on those targets that the uh, ground operations needed. Um, the report from 1943 actually makes this quite clear. On the Eastern Front, the Luftwaffe was used correctly until reaching the Dieper line. From that point forward, the Luftwaffe should have at least partially a engaged Russian railways in the hinterland, and b engaged the manufacturing factories that remained in range. Initially, the continuation of the operations did not permit splitting the available forces. The bombardment of Leningrad and Moscow were even after the stabilization of the front line in defense of the Russian counter-offenses, always postponed due to more pressing demands by the hair. The Germans, having smashed into a wall of ice and fire in front of Moscow, now dug in for a long and cold winter. Based on pre-operational plans, the main objective wasn't met, but now was perhaps the time to think about strategic bombing. The factories within Moscow itself had drastically reduced their output, but the region beyond Moscow still had a significant number of factories and power plants. Those will be important throughout this video, so remember them. Um, thus, uh, talks did actually commence on switching over to missions that also inflicted strategic damage on the industrial hotspots, the targets that can still be reached, um, and both those that produce power to fuel the factories and the factories themselves. The question was now, which one to attack, as not that many bombers could be spared. Should the Luftwaffe hit the power plants, thus siphoning off production without actually destroying the factories, or should it hit the factories, thus destroying the stockpiles and the actual production lines? And this discussion came from the high command, really, whose priorities had changed. Problem was that in 41 only food, fuel and light metals were off limits, but now this list of key industrial sectors that were to be spared um, and captured really, and then put to work, included ammunition, rubber, chemicals, synthetic fats, motor vehicles, iron, steel, you know, the list goes on and on and on. The Richtlinien für die Führung der Wirtschaft in den neu besetzten Ostgebieten from September 1942 makes this quite clear. Suddenly, there was renewed interest in capturing everything intact. So factories couldn't be bombed, but in theory, cutting the power to them would prevent damage to factories while also stopping the Soviet production itself. In theory. Germany, in fact, had also a rather vulnerable power network. So perhaps the experience that they had there was applied here, as the Karl Komitee, the uh, under Dr. Karl, the German chief of power planning, endorsed this plan. In contrast, for Luftwaffe Air Intelligence, who had drawn up a comprehensive list of targets, the choice was clear. The factories, not the power plants, needed to be destroyed, as it was them that supplied the Soviet war machine. The Soviets had, in any case, thus far, every time a factory was threatened to be overrun, either dismantled and evacuated equipment or blown everything up, if not both. So why spare these factories in the first place? But this disagreement between the let's destroy the factories and let's hit the power sides in the German uh, high command was never really properly resolved and thus far nothing more than occasional ad hoc attacks against some factories were flown around this time, 1942, mainly on the initiative of frontline units. It's actually astounding how much time was lost. But in July 42, air intelligence made its stance once again clear with its, open quote, absolute rejection of the point of view that air attacks on Soviet industry must be avoided in order to keep it available to work on German behalf." End quote. Trouble was now that uh, the discussion had turned philosophical. The preparations for the new sovereign offensive against Stalingrad consumed everyone's attention. Eventually, the Luftwaffe had, well, you know the story, it had to mount a considerable effort to supply the army, even flying supplies in by bombers. Um, with some among the Luftwaffe continuing still to try to push forward a comprehensive plan to target Soviet industry and specifically its fuel supplies, the capacities and official backing were lacking at this point. 
Post Stalingrad, the wheels began to turn once more and it this prompted a revision of the standing orders. Slowly the German high command realized that perhaps it had made a mistake in not exploiting the operational freedom the Luftwaffe enjoyed in 1941 and even in 1942 to more systematically combat Soviet infrastructure and production where it was possible. Before continuing, I, I do want to put a small caveat on that, of, of course, here. Um, like I mentioned, there were reasons why the Germans had not launched attacks beyond the perhaps naive hope to recycle Soviet factories. And that was the lack of bombers, the consistent pressure to fly continuous missions in support of the army, and the basing and range problems of the bomber force. While Germany could have launched strategic attacks absolutely earlier if it had wanted to, we have to remember that that would have taken assets away from other areas of the front lines where they were also needed, which adds to the complexity of the situation. But now the Germans had run into disaster at Stalingrad. And in popular memory, this battle, of course, represents the turning point on the Eastern Front. Looking at the air war, the Luftwaffe's failure to supply the army well, that often overshadows everything else, but Stalingrad symbolizes even more to the Luftwaffe. While tactically and operationally the front lines had ebbed and flowed throughout this time, strategically the Germans had been forced to consistently yield ground back to the Soviet Union. Come spring 43, it had lost its army at Stalingrad, but now the front lines from north to south had shifted so that this Luftwaffe only had a few Soviet industrial zones still to choose from. But still in one of its reports it states that, open quote, a useful relief of the front lines from the material pressures of the Red Army in the upcoming battles could be achieved through a scheduled and intensive attack of the war industry. But out of the limited pool available, the German main target now was Gorky, home of the aptly named Gorky Automobile Plant or Gorovsky Automobilny Savot. Popularly abbreviated to GAS, the plants produced tanks, although only a small number of T-34s and rather a lot of the lighter T-60s. Actually, I've seen an estimate that attributed roughly 60% of Soviet light tank production to this one plant, but I have nothing definite. In any case, not the ideal target, but the Germans saw no alternative. And this target was then chosen as part of the German preparation for its last grand summer offensive for what we now know as the Battle of Kursk. This wasn't the first time Gorky was targeted, nor the first time a Soviet factory was at the receiving end of German bombs. What was different this time was that the effort was meant to be consistent, targeted and deal a knockout blow that makes the factory go cold. The Luftwaffe actually reorganized the 4th Flieger Corps, the 4th Air Corps, on a Generalflugball, combining forces of uh, the Kampfgeschade 27 and 55 KG-27 and 55 under one banner. These had used the last months to refresh their forces and actually only flew a couple of limited missions, uh, one of which, for example, on the 2nd of June, uh, hitting the Kursk rail yards. Uh, following that, both transferred up north to take aim at Soviet tank production, both in an effort to cut uh, Soviet supplies and to misdirect Soviet attention. What followed was, on the Eastern Front, an unprecedented strategic bombing campaign, uh, singularly focused at handicapping Soviet military production of T-60s. Flying only at night, seven missions were flown between June 4 and June 21. Uh, just under 1,000 bomber sorties accounted for 1,500 tons of bombs dropped. Roughly two-thirds of those were sent against the plants at Gorky. But another attack took place against, uh, in the south against the Saratov oil refineries, uh, receiving roughly 200 tons of bombs, and the Yaroslav synthetic rubber factories, also up north, uh, roughly 300 tons. But these were sideshows compared to Gorky, and Gorky was heavily hit. Again, the estimates I have don't really specify a clear number, but gas had received significant damage and German losses were incredibly light in return. Telling too is that the Soviet Union reacted with drastic measures, opening up a whole investigation into the failures to stop the German bombers from actually attacking the city. Um, Soviet air defense, well specifically at night, wasn't really the best, but additional AA guns of all calibers were sent to beef up the defense of the production plants. But the plant itself would not be able to continue producing at the same rate for several months. But while this was a success, they provided little tangible effect on Soviet frontline strength, especially for Operation Citadelle, it was actually supposed to support. 
And following the failure at Kursk, the Luftwaffe, which had initially taken part in that battle and then, as usual, was forced to divert its forces and its attention elsewhere, once again became a firefighting force with no ability to strike the Soviet Union on the strategic dimension. Um, at Gorky, it had shown what it could have done, but this was an isolated incident in mid-43 on a target of rather limited value in the end. And by the end of that year, the Luftwaffe reported that many important assets now lay outside our range. But even with the present means, we still possess the ability to engage and destroy parts of the Russian war industry. And it also further notes that could the German Luftwaffe not provide more to victory in the East if it, instead of flying around like artillery and dropping bombs in front of the infantry, attacks the roots of the Russian offensive power, the Russian war industry. That was not to be. The Luftwaffe continued to lobby for permission, also specifically to knock out Soviet plane, and, uh, plane engine production. Uh, some of those plants were actually still in range for the Heinkel 177, for example. But that plan soon faded away as the German lines were pushed ever back. It serves mentioning that a final push to knock out production around Moscow was made just months after Zitadelle. German planners, they understood the predicament the Luftwaffe was in and that it had too few resources to spare for long-range attacks. Thus, such attacks, if made, needed to be pinpoint and devastating with as few resources as possible used. The idea to strike power, the power network was dug up once more and I told you it was going to come back. The Heinkel 177 had been pushed to the Atlantic, but the Fritz X glided bomb had just sunk the Italian battleship Roma in a spectacular fashion. Such a weapon, it was hoped, could also accurately hit the boiler rooms of a power plant or break a hydro plant. And then other more convenient targets in the power network could just be carpet bombed to amplify the effect of the more accurate Fritz X attacks. But should a Fritz X prove incapable of knocking out a dam, the idea was to drop mines into the intake channels in the hope that these then would float towards the dam and an explosion would knock out the turbines. Crazy ideas, yes, but then again, the dam buster bouncing upkeep bomb was also once described by somebody as a tribe beyond the wildest description. But with every passing day, week and month, the preparations and plans became ever more difficult. The targets were now out of range of the Heinkel 111 and the Ju-88, and the Heinkel 177 was available, but not operational in sufficient numbers, and too few targets were now available. To have a significant effect, an integrated power grid needs to be knocked out comprehensively. With only a few plans in range, the question was, why bother? In a twist of sorts, this dilly-dallying actually meant that the Vierte Flieger Corps uh, had remained without much of a mission so far, and while it had taken part in the fighting at times, it was one of those few German Luftwaffe formations that were up to strength with an operational readiness of 80%. In March 1944, and it just dawns on me how impressive that is, March 1944, Luftwaffe Kampfgeschwade at 80% readiness. Considering that no factory or power plant of note was now in range, the Fitter Flieger Corps engaged in a systematic campaign of interdiction on the Eastern Front against Soviet-held rail networks in the Ukraine. While this wasn't strategic warfare as we know it, or in fact the Germans experienced at the hands of the RAF Bomber Command and of course the US 8th Air Force, it was an attempt to use the Flieger Corps to good effect and to provide an effort that sort of brushes the line between the operational and the uh, strategic. Uh, this was significant for the Luftwaffe as standing doctrine regarded such attacks to be only useful during offensive operations rather than the defensive slugging match they were actually now experiencing. In six weeks uh, between March 27 and May the 5th, 1944, roughly 2,700 sorties brought down 3,500 tons of explosives against the Soviet-held rail yards, stations and bridges. Sounds impressive without a reference point, so um, let me give you one. In April 44 alone, the US Army Air Force and the RAF dropped 32,000 tons. Not in total, only on the German-held transportation network. So, while the Germans were perhaps in a more focused campaign, let's say, of railway disruption, hitting only a specific part, not everything, uh, the network between, of course, Brest and Kiev, they, even they knew that the lack of resources they had and the lacking longevity of the operation, as well as the speedy repairs by the Soviets, made this campaign uh, 
little more than a paper cut. From now on, things get desperate. In mid-1944, there would be no more talk about any sort of conventional large-scale Luftwaffe effort on the Eastern Front. And you know what's coming. When the conventional stuff goes out of the window, and the Allies land in Normandy, and the Red Army races itself to Berlin, it's time for those war-changing ideas that will certainly and most assuredly bring forth a complete reversal of Germany's fortunes. They didn't. But the Germans played around with the idea of dropping uh, special commandos near power plants and factories until they realized that they can probably not carry enough explosives to actually fulfill the deed. After that, there was the idea of asking volunteers to fly one-way trips with their bombers. <laughs> they didn't actually find anyone who really exhibited both the necessary delusion and the required experience to pull this off. And also they realized that, hey, this is a waste of fuel, so let's not do it. And then finally, we come to the Mistel, a bomber repurposed into a flying bomb, controlled by a small fighter plane that would detach itself just prior to impact. Operation Eisenhammer was given a bombastic name, but never struck an ambush. The airfields in East Prussia where these uh, missions were supposed to be launched and that were close enough to the Soviet power plants around Moscow, yes, we're still looking at the same targets as in 1942, with the Germans actually expecting to knock out 40% of the electrical power grip with the missile. Um, those airfields were taken too soon by the Soviets. In any case, 100 missiles were needed, but only 18 were available, and these were eventually used to destroy some of the bridges over the Oder in an attempt to delay the Soviet advance on Berlin for even only a couple of hours. And that brings us to the close on this one. Thank you very much for watching. Please consider sharing the video, liking it, and subscribing. Remember to hit that bell button to receive a notification when I publish a new video, because YouTube for some reason doesn't want to tell you. Uh, and thank you also very much to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. The offer and link is in the description below. And as always, have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky.